the nuclear time. And to illustrate that a bit better, <coughs> what you see <coughs> is the bridge helix, to which I alluded previously, is really too far to make from the nucleotide to make contact. I should mention that the nucleotide is shown here in orange for a purine, in blue for a pyrimidine. Both structures were separately solved, and the corresponding uh, trigger loops are purple and yellow. The bridge helix is much too far to make contact, as I already indicated. It does, however, interact with the coding base on the template strand, and that's a point I'll return to later of some significance. The trigger loop is in close proximity and makes extensive interaction with the nucleoside triphosphate in the addition site. It <clears throat> now, the trigger loop had previously been seen in, a, in many structures. It's so far been seen in a dozen polymerase structures, but only in the two recently solved that I have just mentioned. With a correctly matched nucleotide in the addition site, is it in proximity to the nucleotide, though that's the confirmation in purple. And all the other cases, the dashed line in red and the other structures shown in blue and yellow and yet additional structures, it is some 30 angstroms distant from the nucleotide in the addition site. The trigger loop is evidently a mobile element. It swings like a trap door beneath a correctly matched nucleotide in the addition site. As I have mentioned, it makes extensive contact with the nucleotide. It is engaged in a network of interactions with the nucleotide. It contacts the nucleotide base. It contacts the beta phosphate. It also contacts both 2' prime and 3' prime hydroxyl groups of the sugar uh, through other Paul II residues. Uh, it even contacts the 2' prime hydroxyl group of the nucleotide just added to the growing RNA chain through the same extensive network of interactions. Now, the importance of this network, network is shown by the consequences of mutagenesis. So in blue are indicated mutations already uh, recorded in the literature uh, which are abundant in the trigger loop that interfere with transcript elongation. Uh, in red uh, are shown additional mutations, some overlapping derived by Craig Kaplan from a recent uh, saturating genetic screen. Now I would just call your attention to the asparagine residue that was revealed both from previous studies and in the Kaplan screen. This asparagine residue interacts with the three-prong hydroxyl group of the enter nucleoside triphosphate. When that asparagine is substituted by serine uh, in the mutant form indicated with the purple bars, <laughs> then uh, discrimination between the um, a wild type or normal nucleotide and a three-prong deoxy nucleotide while lacking the three-prong hydroxyl group is lost. Uh, now, the discriminate, the, uh, what is indicated here on the abscissa is the rate of addition, the half max, the, the concentration of nucleotide required for a half maximal rate of addition to the growing RNA chain. And you see the discrimination in any case uh, between um, the normal nucleotide and a three prime uh, hydro, uh, deoxy analog is only about tenfold. The discrimination on the basis of a uh, between ribonucleotide and 2' prime deoxy uh, uh, nucleotide is far greater, about greater than a thousandfold. How is such discrimination achieved on the basis of a single hydroxyl group when, as I have told you, uh, the energy of a single hydrogen bond can only give about a tenfold effect? The answer lies in the precise alignment of the trigger loop with the correctly matched and appropriate nucleoside triphosphate. So I've alluded to the contacts with the base, with the beta phosphate. When the alignment is precise, then the side chain of histidine 1085 is three and a half angstroms from the beta phosphate, an appropriate distance to promote the flow of electrons during nucleophilic attack of the end of the RNA chain and phosphoanhydride bond breakage. So the trigger loop when precisely aligned, will literally trigger phosphodiester bond formation. The trigger loop can couple recognition through the trigger loop network of a correct nucleoside triphosphate to catalysis.
Now, in the case of a two prime deoxynucleotide, when lacking that single hydroxyl group, alignment uh, is imprecise. So, in the RNA DNA hybrid, uh, to which I just alluded, with a ribonucleotide paired to a deoxy in the coding strand of the DNA, then the alignment, as I have mentioned, is appropriate for catalysis. In the case of a DNA DNA duplex formed of a deoxynucleotide, a gross misalignment occurs by a distance of two angstroms, the difference in diameter of a DNA RNA hybrid helix and a DNA DNA helix. In consequence of misalignment, no catalysis. To move on now, uh, the trigger loop network includes not only interactions with the nucleotide, but also with the bridge helix, which, as I have already mentioned, makes contact through side chains of two residues with the coding base in the DNA strand. Now, in the structure of a bacterial RNA polymerase solved by my former colleague Seth Garst, there is also a trigger loop, uh, but in a different conformation. If there is a bend, that produces a movement of those interacting side chains by a distance of three angstroms along the direction of the template strand. Three angstroms corresponds to one base step. Uh, this observation led us to surmise some years ago that transitions between straight and bent states of the bridge helix underlie nucleic acid translocation across the enzyme surface for transcription. So we think of the bridge helix as a kind of molecular ratchet. It allows the polymerase to let go of the DNA and RNA for translocation, while at the same time maintaining its grip on the growing end of the DNA and RNA hybrid to preserve the register of transcription. There is now a good deal of both chemical cross-linking and also genetic evidence uh, to support this idea. Finally, let me turn to the last step in the fundamental mechanism of transcription, which is the release of product. Now, in the structure originally determined, uh, that process was not evident. Um, the DNA-RNA hybrid was fully hydrogen bonded along its entire length. In a subsequent structure determined by Ken Westover, we could actually observe uh, the process of transcript release. So what I do here is zoom in on just the top end, the 7th, 8th, and ninth residues of the hybrid helix in the new structure, where you can see a uh, release actually in the process. So at position 7, one has a canonical DNA-RNA, DNA-RNA hybrid base pair. Uh, the bases are coplanar, with a distance of 3.4 angstroms between them appropriate for hydrogen bonding. But at positions 8, 9, and 10, there is a progressive deviation from coplanarity and splaying apart of the strands. And this is in consequence of the intervention of three protein loops we call LID, Rudder, and Fork Loop 1. LID interacts with RNA. Rudder interacts closely with the DNA to enforce the separation of strands. Fork Loop 1 actually makes contact uh, electrostatic interaction through positively charged amino acid side chains with the sugar phosphate backbone of both the DNA and the RNA at position six and seven. And that way it stabilizes the DNA-RNA hybrid helix at these positions. It prevents the unraveling brought about by rudder and lid from extending the whole length and uh, interfering with transcription. With that, I'll turn now from the fundamental mechanism of transcription and in the last few minutes, I'll tell you about our studies extending the analysis I've just described to the larger complexes that include the general factors necessary for the initiation of transcription and also mediated. I'll tell you just about, I'll tell you about only two structures of, that include components of general transcription factors. Each of these reveals uh, what we believe to be an important principle of the initiation mechanism and from all of the information I'll show you how a preliminary picture of how that process takes place may be derived. Now, the first of these uh, structures that includes an additional factor is a co-crystal of RNA polymerase with factor B. This is the work of Dave Bushnell. Uh, and I show it to you in two parts. First, the amino terminal half of factor B, and then the part of the structure that includes the C terminal 